Hello, BookTube. I am doing a weird kind of read-along of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings with David Wiley and Tony from An Erudite Adventure. We started with The Two Towers, as opposed to starting with The Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, and we've just been moving on. Uh, and I, pretty much early on, adopted the idea of just reading a chapter at a time. A really slow crawl through this book that I've read so many times and loved so much. You'd think that for such a thing, I'll never do it again. You'd think that I would go to the the three volume box set that I, I love that I've had forever and ever, but no, I I have a double of this. This is a rare instance where the movie adaptation cover is actually really nice. This is a really nice edition with with uh, French flaps and and nice floppy binding and all. So I just went with this instead. And we have been following the Two Tower. Or the Return of the King is where we're what we're reading now, and it's set up like the Two Towers into parallel plots. So it's not just one story like in The Fellowship. And we've been following the first of those. We're reading the first part of The Return of the King. We're finishing with that today. Which follows all of our heroes on the field of battle. The other storyline, the other, the other story realm is Frodo and Sam walking the One Ring of Power into Mordor in order to try to destroy it in Mount Doom. And we don't know anything about that. In this part of the book, we don't know anything about that. Instead, in this part of the book, we know what our heroes are doing on the battlefield against the conventional battlefield forces of Sauron, the Dark Lord, the Lord of the Rings. And so far, the, those, those exploits have been victorious. The good guys, Gandalf the Wizard, Aragorn, the heir to the West, uh, the various princes and uh, powerful warriors that they have assembled around them, they have achieved great victories. They have beaten back an assault on Minas Tirith, the capital of the human kingdom of Gondor. They have destroyed the king of the Nazgul, the, the chief servant of Sauron in this war against Middle-earth, a supernatural being who would have been invulnerable, in, instead dies on the battlefield. Uh, and in the last chapter that we talked about, the last debate, they talk about what they should do now. This isn't what most of them expected. They have achieved a minor victory. It's come at great cost. Denethor, the steward of Gondor, is dead. Theoden, the king of Rohan, is dead. Eowyn and Faramir lie wounded in, in the Houses of Healing. But nevertheless, the good guys have won. And in the, in the last debate, Gandalf points out what Denethor says in his madness before he takes his own life, which is that against the power that is rising in the East, there is no victory on the battlefield. I'm not talking anything here about the One Ring. There's no way to defeat Sauron with conventional forces. All together, trying as hard as they could, they barely managed to beat back one assault. And the next assault will be ten times worse. And then ten times worse than that. Uh, Gandalf acknowledges the truth in this. But he also reminds everybody that the real quest here is the ring. Despite the fact that all of these princes and, and a wizard and an elf and a dwarf and all of that, despite the fact that they're all assembled on the battlefield, the real quest here, the real battle, is Frodo's. Being fought without any weapons, alone, and far from any help. If, if that quest fails... If Sauron gets the One Ring, then his victory will be complete, no matter what, no matter how many people are on the battlefield at the Pelennor Fields. And they all know it. By now, they all trust Gandalf. The people who don't trust Gandalf are dead. So they, they all trust Gandalf by now, and when he says that, they agree. That their only job is to distract Sauron from his real peril. As long as his attention is on them, as long as he thinks they have the One Ring, maybe... Uh, he won't. He won't be paying enough attention to his own backyard, where Frodo and Sam are slowly making their way closer and closer to Orodruin, to, to to the fires of Mount Doom. Uh, that's the strategy, and as Gandalf points out in the last debate, it could very well be that Frodo succeeds, but we still die anyway, and never even know that he succeeds. This is a hopeless thing. We must put ourselves entirely in a trap. We are the bait in a trap, and they decide. In this chapter, the, the, the chapter that we're reading today is called The Black Gate Opens. It's meant to be a parallel to The Black Gate is Closed, the chapter about the Black Gate being closed. Because they decide in this chapter that uh, now that that has been their decision in the last debate, 
they will go through with it. They will absolutely go through with it. In other words, they will march to the Black Gate of Baradur. They will, mat they will march into Mordor. They don't have even a fraction of the strength necessary to give battle to the forces of Mordor on the battlefield. We're not talking about the Nazgul here or about Sauron's own supernatural ability. They don't have a fraction of his forces, conventional forces. But it's the only thing they can do. If they wait, they give him time to prepare and maybe concentrate on the wrong things. They have to keep his attention focused where it doesn't, where it shouldn't be. They have to keep his attention focused west. So they decide to assemble as many forces as they can and march to the Black Gates of Mordor and demand that Sauron surrender himself to the justice of the King of Gondor, King Elisar. And they, the chapter that we're reading here is, uh, a large chunk of it is them marching through the wastelands, the uh, version of which we have already seen. Sam and Frodo have already covered territory a lot like this in terms of its desolation. And that unnerves some of the men. We're told in this chapter that some of the men who were at the siege of Minas Tirith don't have the nerve to keep going. It's a very weird moment in Tolkien, but it shows that he is not writing uh, just black and white Sir Walter Scott heroics. Some of the men uh, from uh, Rohan and and the Westfold, the closer they get to Mordor, the more they feel the horrible oppression of this area, the more frightened they become. We're told, uh, let's see here, for to them, Mordor had been from childhood a name of evil and yet unreal, a legend that had no part in their, in their simple life. And now they walked like men in a hideous dream made true, and they understood not this, not this war, nor why fate would lead them to such a pass. And eventually some of them say they can't go on, that they will, they will turn back. Aragorn has no choice but to let them, even though it limits what is already a very small number of people that he's bringing with him. Uh, and eventually they get to the Black Gate of Mordor, and they, they pound upon it. Let the Lord of the Black Land come forth. We, we, you, you have made unjust war. Come forth and have justice be done upon you. And at, at first they don't know if they're going to be ignored, but then the gate opens. And the mouth of Sauron enters. A man on a, on a creature that looks like a horse approaches them. You will remember the scene from the Peter Jackson movie. There, this is this scene in the book is more subtle. There's no abrupt beheading or anything like that, and the dialogue goes on a little bit longer. But it is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. The mouth of Sauron presents them with Sauron's demands, which you know we have not heard until now. We have not heard what it is that Sauron actually wants. Uh, and we get it. We get what he actually wants. So I want to, I want to read that to you. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to talk about here in the, in the parley with the mouth of Sauron. Uh, but uh, I want to read you the terms that the messenger gives. Uh, these are the terms, said the messenger, and smiled as he eyed them one by one. The rabble of Gondor and its deluded allies shall withdraw at once beyond the Anduin, first taking oaths never again to assail Sauron the Great in arms, open or secret. All lands east of the Anduin shall be Sauron's forever, solely. West of the Anduin, as far as the Misty Mountains and the Gap of Rohan, shall be a tributary to Mordor, and men there shall bear no weapons, but shall have leave to govern their own affairs but they shall help to rebuild Isengard, which they have wantonly destroyed, and that shall be Sauron's, and there his lieutenant shall dwell, not Saruman, but one more worthy of trust. And the narrative says, looking in the messenger's eyes, they read his thought. He was to be that lieutenant, and gather all that remained of the West under his sway. He would be their tyrant, and they his slaves. And Gandalf responds right away, uh, even in this worst, most darkest moment, uh, he says, this is much to demand for the delivery of one servant, that your master should receive in exchange what he might fight else a many of war to gain. Or has the field of Gondor destroyed his hope in war, so that he falls to haggling? And the one prisoner that they're talking about is Frodo. The mouth of Sauron produces the mithril coat that, Sa that Frodo wore when he was with the Fellowship. He produced, the, the mouth of Sauron produces tokens that Frodo has been captured and taunts them, 
says, I hope this is no one that you, that you liked because we've tortured him. We've put him to enormous amounts of pain. We will keep him in the dungeons of Barador forever, torturing him until he is unrecognizable. And then we might release him as a sign to you of what your own carelessness has done. The mouth of Sauron says, perhaps you're hoping that his errand succeeded. It has failed. And it's a wonderful, subtle moment because we, the reader, know that the plan certainly has not failed. And we know in that moment that Sauron has no idea what the plan is. <laughs> the one thing that we know for sure in that exchange, and that uh, Tolkien implies that he doesn't have to state it, he trusts your intelligence, the one thing that our heroes realize in that exchange is that the, the errand hasn't completely failed. If it had, Sauron would have the One Ring. And he obviously doesn't. Or he wouldn't need to do any of this. He obviously doesn't have it. And has no idea that that was the errand. He thinks whatever, a spy, something like that, who knows what he thinks it is. But in that moment, our heroes know that fighting is still worthwhile. That distracting Sauron in this final battle is still worthwhile to do. Because he doesn't have the ring. Uh... And so they are defiant, and they take back the mithril coat, and they ride back to their people just in time as the gates of Barad-dûr are open and forces pour out. Uh, troll men and uh, evil, corrupted men and innumerable orcs pour out of all of the openings and slag heaps and doors of Barad-dûr. And that is where this chapter and this part of The Return of the King ends. It ends with our heroes completely surrounded and besieged just they they have marched all the way to mordor in order to distract sauron and this is the price they pay being utterly annihilated on the battlefield so they are drawing up their ranks and they are getting ready for ready for what will certainly be the final battle uh whether the frodo's errand succeeds or not and that's where the part of this book ends now we're moving on but not to the conclusion of that scene very masterfully done tolkien is instead going to split the action is we're going to move the action to Mordor, to Frodo and Sam, and leave Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and Gandalf behind. Uh, so we'll do that. We'll do that next time. That is, uh, that is part six, the sixth and final part of uh, the of the Lord of the Rings, so with the chapter of the Tower of Kirith Ungol. That's next in this weird read along that I'm doing of Lord of the Rings. So we will do that next time. I will see you then. Thank you, Book Two.